we're just going to jump in, and pastor's not here to slow me down, so we're just going to dig it. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for the privilege again. Lord, as we uh, open up your word, I pray it would be precious to us. Once again, I ask, Lord, that I look at the beam hanging out my own eye and uh, challenge everyone else to do the same. And uh, when you call us to minister to our loved ones, especially our spouse, our husband, our wife, I pray we would learn how to do it in a way that's consistent with your word, that we would take the appropriate position we have in Christ and then learn how to minister effectively for your glory, for the good of our loved ones. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Ephesians 5, verse 21 says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Most theologians put that in the previous uh, passage, the previous paragraph, but uh, I guess with the women's movement, what's going on today, they want to say that actually, instead of being a conclusion of a previous thought, they want to say that's the introduction to a new thought called submission. Uh, I, I appreciate the tension between the two, but I don't think it really matters. Going on, verse 22, wives, be in subject to your own husbands, not someone else's husband, your own husband, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. Verse 24, that's uh, in Ephesians 5, if you're finding me, verse 24 says, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be in sub to their husbands in everything. That's one of those all-inclusive words. What does everything mean? It's like, everything means everything? That's like all means A-L-L, -L, all means all? Everything? Holy smokes. Uh, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Now, boy, that, now that's a challenge. Love my wife the way Jesus loves me? Uh, I'm going to have a tough time with that one. And he gave himself up for her. Well, I'm too selfish for that, I think. I'd like to think I'm not, but I think I'm too selfish. That he might sanctify her. Look at the job of the husband. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word. I know some husbands that like to use the word of God to demean their wives. But I'm looking for a, a husband that would use the word appropriately so much that when he's done using the word of God, the wife's clean, purified, spotless. And wives, I'm not asking you to critique your husband, certainly not now, but husbands, you know, how am I doing about scrubbing my wife with the word of God so that she's clean, spotless, pure? Verse 26 again, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word, by the washing of the water with the word. Verse 27, that he might, what am I going to do with my wife? That he might present himself to himself, the church, in all glory, having no spot, no spot, no spot. Does no mean no spot? No spot. Or wrinkle. Well, I guess we struggle with wrinkles. Uh, or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Father God, as we talk about marriage again, I pray that we would uh, look at it from your word and receive from your word what the word says. And Lord, let us struggle with it. I ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in truth, I'm not fair in the counseling center. Uh, and when I'm counseling with couples, I'm not fair. Number one, I couldn't be fair anyway because I'm just not that fair. I, I, I always have biases. And I, uh, I, I promise you now, I have biases. I, I believe the word of God. It's my bias. I believe I have a Christian worldview, a, a Christian Christian, not, not small c Christian, but a capital C, capital C, Christian Christian worldview. I love to meet Christian Christians because I meet some non-Christian Christians. Um, but when I, I'm not fair in the counseling room because I'm always tougher on the guy. Why would I be tougher on the guy? 
I'm harder on husbands. That's why when you look at your list, there's husbands, A, B, C, D, E. There's, there's five husband things, and ladies only have four, I think, or something like that. I'm tougher on guys. Why am I tougher on guys? Because guys are the God-given head. And their head, whether they like it or not, their head, whether they're a good head or not a good head, they're responsible. If I'm going to trust the word of God, then I'm going to touch on these sacred arguments that people have, but he doesn't lead well, or he's, he doesn't, he's not a spiritual leader. Oh, he's a spiritual leader. He may be a terrible one, he may be a great one, but he's a leader, and wives can never be the spiritual leader, guys. Now, she may, you, she may be the one, come on, we're going to church this week, and you'd rather stay at home and rest up so you could watch the ball game later, but like it or not, us men are designed by God, called by God. We are to be the leaders whether we like it or not. We're the leaders. Good ones or bad ones, we're the leaders. And I think when Christian ladies get engaged, they're expecting their guy to be the spiritual head. But how many guys, don't raise your hands and don't elbow, um, how many guys were taught by their dads to be a spiritual leader? I've, I have a, just a handful, not, not a full hand, but almost a handful. Of, uh, how many guys were taught by their dad how to love their wives? How many guys were taught by their, their dad and they didn't get the job done? So now I'm going to be, a pastor doesn't know I'm going to do this. Uh, and, uh, but how many guys have a spiritual leader, a pastor that came alongside you and discipled you enough so, hey, spiritual leadership in the home, this is, this is what it's supposed to look like, guys. Um, it's tough. It's tough. Um, we're not learning how to be spiritual heads. We're not learning how to lead our families. And it's not sitting at dinner, reading a passage of scripture, having a word of prayer, and saying I'm a spiritual head. Because when he's writing this stuff, canon was just being penned and not collected and not confirmed. There was no written word. They didn't take the Torah out and open it up and read from Isaiah 53. That, that's, that wasn't the spiritual head. And so, coming up in an unbelieving home, I didn't know what spiritual headship looked like. I, I'm truly ignorant. And I, I'm still studying. I'm trying to figure out what, what spiritual leadership looked like. I love to read Bible stories to my grandkids, and they love it. And I'm trying to find, if you, if, if you have a home Bible study, a children's Bible that talks about the armor of God, they did that for VBS in our church this summer. And my, my three-year-old granddaughter wants me to read her a Bible story about the armor of God like they did in vacation Bible school. Do you have a children's book about the, the, the armor? She can tell me what the pieces are. But my little three-year-old, you know, and I, she can't even say right. You know, so I don't know how she says the armor of God, but she does. I, kn I know because her mom, my daughter, is saying, she's saying the armor of God, Dad. And I said, I don't have a storybook with that one in it. I don't know. Well, what's spiritual headship? I'm responsible to be the head like it or not like it or not. So it's a big deal. And when I get married, I make this thing called a covenant. It's the only covenant I have. And it's like, I, 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 for years, I have so belittled the covenant I made with God. I said, okay, God, I'm going to take care of my, spiritually take care of my family. I'm going to, two become one. Everything changes after the wedding cake, the honeymoon, everything's done. It's all different. What you got wasn't what you thought you were getting, I guarantee it. And so now you're married. Uh, the wedding day is all about her, which is not biblical, but it's all about her. And uh, all about that dress, which is not biblical. But it's all about, the, it's in the apocrypha, I've been told, but um, it's just, it's all about her and the dress. And, uh, and now, there's no idolatry about that dress or that day. It's just, it's just what I've been told. So if, if she said it, it must be it. And so I, I don't get it. It has nothing to do with, now, now they have nail things that, that's part of the package. And I, I don't get it. But husbands, I, I don't think we know how to do this. And we make a covenant. And it's kind of like the first year of marriage. Uh, Deuteronomy 22 says during the first year of marriage, the husbands don't go out to war. They stay at home. That's one thing. Oh, great. I'll kick back the first year. Put, put my feet. I'm kicking back. I got a year to do this. And then at the end of that, then they say, but read the set next phrase. I've got to learn how to make my wife happy. A year. Stay at home and figure her out. When I first came, we were at Calvary, and there was a, a, 
a pastor's thing, and there were some 600 pastors there, and I remember, I was a newbie, I was a kid right out of seminary, and I'm going into pastoral ministry and counseling ministry, and I'm listening to one of the guys gets up, and their pulpit's a little bit higher, and he's got to be, you know, Mr. Hotshot, and I'll never tell you who he is, uh, um, but it's none of our professors, and so he's up there, and he comes up real jovial, and he starts telling wife jokes. It's a pastor's conference. There's probably a dozen, Smarge Jordan would be one of them, probably a dozen ladies around, and they say, ah, oh, women, you can never figure them out. And the Lord stuck me. And I was a newbie then. Now, I'm not, I'm not a newbie anymore. <laughs> um, I had hair then. But I was a newbie, and, and, I, and he started making jokes and degrading his wife. And everybody that I saw was laughing. And I, I, I kind of made a promise I've never had to do this, but I wonder if I'd have the guts to do it. I think I might, because I'm not a newbie anymore. I said, if I, I felt like going up there, grabbing the microphone, and say, excuse me, Pastor, with no disrespect intended, you're humiliating your wife. You're talking down. And us husbands are supposed to dwell with our wife in an understanding way, giving honor unto her, and you're not giving your wife honor. I think you disqualified yourself from preaching. I'd love to be able to do that. So if Kevin's there now, I got someone to back me up, I'll go do it. But, <laughs> but I really feel like, and it's like, we're not getting it. We're not getting it. I don't hear that so much anymore. I don't hear wife jokes. When I, all men's gym, I went to the gym and men would start joking about their wives. And, and I, I got to be known after a while, I said, uh, th those jokes that are coming out of your mouth, is that the same mouth you're going to use to kiss your wife when you go home tonight? Does your wife know you talk about her like that? You know, he's complaining he's not getting any. So I said, do you wonder why? So men are, men are uh, some ladies over here were telling me they don't want to be stupid anymore. I, I like that. I don't want to be stupid anymore. So marriage is a covenant, and I'm supposed to leave, cleave, and, and weave is the, the thing. I, I need to become one with my wife, and I need to honor her. And I like the expression, a dwell with her wife, spend time with her, quality time with her. Not at half time, <laughs> you know, not on commercial break. I mean, Spend quality time. Dwell with your wife. And they could do that in those days. Dwell with your wife in an understanding way. Figure her out. Don't say I can never figure out. I'm going to figure you out. I want to know. And if you haven't done stupid too much, she might trust you with some golden nuggets of truth so you can honor her. And then I want to take it and I want to take that and honor her and care for her and not forget about her that uh, my wife wasn't feeling good yesterday. I didn't want to forget that yesterday. So this morning when I touched base with her, how you feel, first, how you feeling? I didn't want to forget, oh, you're sick, but I'm doing something important for God, so don't worry about you not feeling good. I mean, I used to be like that. You know, this isn't this humor. This is reality. I, uh, well, I'm Dr. Steve. You know, I'm, you know, all that prideful stuff really shoot myself in the foot. So now it's like, sweetheart, how you, are you, I'm feeling better. Oh, great. Good, 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 good. That's a nice thing. So I want to honor her. I would love my wife, and I, I think I did too much damage in the early years. I would love my wife to feel honored, valued. I'd like her to feel like a treasure. And I promise you, before God Almighty, I am trying to do things that would help my wife to feel like a treasure, but I think I did so much damage, I don't know if she'll ever feel treasured. I was a jerk. And so now I really want to get to the other place where I become a minister of Ephesians chapter uh, um, 5 here, where I'm doing what my ministry to my wife is helping her clean up the mess. I'm supporting her without degrading her. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I love chapter 8, 1 of Romans. I'm, not, I'm never going to condemn her again. Therefore, the grace, I've done worse is the way I look at it. I'm the head, so I have more responsibility. She's not responsible for me. I'm responsible for her to minister the word of God, as it says in this chapter, to, to um, minister in such a way and courageously come, be willing to go into that place where I might even do it wrong. And if she says I'm doing it wrong, like most of us men don't want to be corrected by our wives, if we're told we're doing it wrong, then we walk away in shame. Shame's a bad deal. Don't do that. Come back and say, thank you for letting me know. Thank you for not stuffing it and pretending everything was okay, because women are fakers. <laughs> women are fakers. No, women, close your ears. Don't listen to this. Women will stuff it so much because they don't want to deal with us. You know, they're sick and tired of us guys. And, and women will want, you know, just, uh, it's, it's okay. It's, and I know in my heart, I want to believe, oh, it's okay. it's okay. I'm off the hook. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye. It's not okay. It's not okay. Now, I wish they would be more honest. And now I think my wife's brutally honest. <laughs> and I say, thank you. I, I got this new knee-jerk reaction. You know, you know what happens when you go to the doctor's office and you cross your legs and you get that little hammer thing, boing! That's called a, a natural reflex reaction, boing, boing. 
You know how to stop that boing? All you have to do is tighten up your muscles. And you, you turn on your muscles, all of a sudden there's no boing left. Your knee won't go. So it's kind of like we want to relax at home and not be on guard and not be responsible to minister to the word of, from the word of God to our wives. We just want to sit back and whatever comes out naturally. You know, I don't know about you guys. You know what comes out of me naturally? The flesh. So I have to pay attention. I have to tighten up so my natural knee-jerk reactions don't react that way. He said, well, that takes a lot of time and energy and thoughtfulness. Yeah. It's called consideration. We're going to get to that. Pastor, I need to know what time I'm done. 12.30? When the bell goes off, you let me know. <laughs> okay, you let me know when the bell goes off. That's good, good, because I've I got to make sure I get to the end of this one. So, um, good. So, uh, I, I can't relax, and, and I have to be spiritually attentive. It takes energy. It's kind of like when we were in marriage counseling, and uh, I, I was the, the stupid jerk mess guy, and uh, the counselor came up to me, because, Steve, uh, you know, when you leave your house and what you're doing for Christ, that's all good. The Holy Spirit will take care of that mess, but what you're doing at home is really destroying your family. So, man, I don't want to do that. I love these people. So he says, and there's this breezeway from, from the garage, breezeway to the house, and he said, you have to, in your mind, you have to put a plaque on the breezeway, so when you walk up those three steps to get in the house, that plaque says, your ministry starts here. That, that's, you know what the church says? You're, you're entering the mission field when you leave the church. You're entering the ministry when you go home. That's what this passage teaches me. And so as it teaches me that, I said, so wh what do I need to do? And my wife, I, somehow we got this illustration of a five-gallon pail. And he, we agreed that I have to go home with a five-gallon pail of energy to minister to my home whenever I come home. Don't go home if you don't have five gallons of energy. Well, what am I going to do with all that energy? Empty the trash, dishwasher, match the socks, whatever it needs doing, you do. And so I got into practice. So to this day, I see the plaque on the side of our, our house there. Ministry begins here. Go inside, five, five gallons of, of uh, five pounds. And uh, when I'm really spent, like I'm, I'm going to be pumped up today. It's early in the day. I'm not getting home at midnight tonight, thank the Lord. Uh, but when I come home late uh, and I'm exhausted and my wife's up, and uh, I, I'll admit to her, sweetheart, I love you. Uh, I don't know how to fulfill my obligation to you right now. I don't have five gallons of energy. Got about two and a half. What needs doing? And my sweetheart wife will sometimes say, everything's taken care of. Just go to bed. Oh, really? You don't really mean that. You're lying to me again. No, 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 no. <laughs> trash is out. See, trash is gone. Dishes. Just go get some rest. We'll talk in the morning. You want to talk tonight? I got two and a half. No, you're exhausted. Go to bed. So I only asked, we, the dealers, I only asked twice, you know, do you need anything? No. Are you sure? That's it. I said two times. I, I learned this in counseling. You know, I asked twice. If you, she says no twice, I'm off the hook. Then if she lied to me twice in one night, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm off the hook then. But husbands need to learn how to lay down their life. Uh, now, now, lay down the life. Does everything, like it, that, everything, that all A-L-L -L word, does all mean all, does everything mean everything in Scripture? Well, uh, you know, not opening day, right? You know, Pennsylvania, not the opening day of trout. No, everything. Well, all right, trout's one thing, but not opening day of buck season. Everything. Well, what about the Super Bowl? Especially if Philadelphia Eagles beat the... <laughs> we're, we're in trouble. We're, uh, pastor said, don't ever say that here. So uh, he, he wore that... Now he's got the socks. There's a World Series coming or something. I don't get so. So in everything, it can't matter. Because we're supposed to set our affections on things above, not the things of this world. We're a mess. And husbands are really bad. Now wives, your ears are still off. Let her be. Um, sanctify them by the ministry of the word. A is marriage. B is sanctify. C is love them and agape love. And yesterday, when we talked about marriage, we talked about relationship and intimacy. What is an agape love? An agape love is a choice love, a sacrificial choice love, which means it's going to cost me, and not just a new diamond ring, it's going to cost me heart stuff, uh, a, a, a choice to sacrificially love, care for, uh, for her good and not of my own selfish gain. I'm not giving to give. I'm not giving, uh, uh, I'm giving to give, not giving to get. It's kind of like sex, you know, when the teenagers, uh, this is true, you know, you know it. It used to be, it hasn't changed much. And when I work with teens, guys will give love to get sex and girls will give sex to get love. And I think the same thing happens in marriages all too much. 
Uh, there's an awful lot was said about reestablishing intimacy in a marriage love relationship that we did yesterday in the second session. If you weren't there, I think it, the, the stuff we talked about graciously, respectfully, candidly, it's, it's a big deal. How do we fall out of love? How do we fall back in love? And we talked about it socially, emotionally, physically, uh, um, spiritually. Uh, phys- how, do, how do we fall back in love? And uh, Scott Peck wrote the book, The Road Less Traveled, talks about falling in love. It's not a mystery. Marriage is a mystery. Falling in love is very candid. If you do the same things you did back then, now you're going to fall in love again. If you don't do the things back th- that you did back then, now you're not going to fall in love again. And people say, I can't fall in love with him again. He's hurt me too bad. He's cheated. He's done this. He's done that. He's beat me. All those terrible things. If he would do the same things he did when you first married, it may take time. You know, Christianity is not microwave popcorn. It doesn't happen that way. It's a crock pot, and it never gets on to high. It's always on low. What you sow, you reap. The law of the harvest is you sow today, you don't harvest tomorrow. It takes a season with all the right care in the garden. And marriage is the garden, how you, how you taking care of the weeds that are in there, how you taking care of the investment of the seeds and uh, the fertilizer, and the watering and the sun of it, all that needs to. So A is marriage, B is sanctified, C is love and an unconditional agape love. Uh, letter D is learn how to please your wife. That's the number tw- numbers 22 in 1 Corinthians 7 passage about learning you know, how to do that. 1 Peter 3, 7, I said, but it's a huge deal, 1 Peter 3, 7. It's a huge deal. Husbands. Dwell with your wife. Quality time. What makes quality? You know, my wife still loves when she goes Christmas shopping. Um, um, I, I have no idea why retail does all night. Um, you know, a- after dinner, I, after turkey, I, I'm ready to take a nap. Well, the sales start. you, you got to be kidding me. Now, my wife was cured of that for a while, and then I got one of my younger daughters, my youngest daughter, grows, Mom, we need to go get the sales. She ruined it. She ruined it. I'm telling you, I, I need a divorce counselor now. They're called lawyers. No, I need a marriage counselor <laughs> that gets us back together again. And so I need to learn how to love my way, 1 Peter 3, 7, in such a way that she's honored and valued. And uh, it, it, when it, not, not on the ride home, not today at lunch, but some other time, guys, your homework assignment is, among other things, is go for a walk with your wife. Well, it might be chilly out. Dress for it. Take her for a ride and park at the park. Something you would have done as a teenager when you fell madly in love with that gal and said, Sweet, we need to talk. I'm not convinced you feel like a treasure. I do a lot of good things. I'm basically a guy's guy. And she's, oh, I love him. He's a good guy. Yeah, perfect yet? Nah. And I would encourage all of us, because we talked about a growth plan for next year. How do I grow for next year? Um, what are some of my goals? And I, I, professional goals, spiritual goals, personal goals, family goals. What are your goals for next year? Corporate America does it all the time. We're so far behind. We should press towards the mark of that high call. What's the mark for you and your family? Is there a mark? Most families I know don't have marks. I give them all the counselors on staff. They have to have a growth plan. And uh, I said yesterday, between Christmas and New Year's, I've got to formulate a growth plan for the next year. And they can ask me mine, and I can ask them then. We can pull out. And, and if you can't write it down, you don't have one. Oh, I know what it is. I got it. Well, then write it down. No, I don't need to write it. If you can't write it down, if you won't write it down, you ain't got it. You're just a liar. Don't tell anybody. Uh, I know the truth about uh, that kind. I've been there, done that, of course. So now I want to make sure it's concrete and I can do that. So I want to do that so my wife will feel more like a treasure now. I want her to feel like a treasure. And I'm doing the very best intentionally. Uh, I bring home five gallons of, of energy every time. I just do it. I do it. I do it. And, uh, she may, and she'll challenge me. I'll say, where's your five gallons? Right here. What do you need? And she gets, and now, because, you know, this is the way it is. You know, I walk in the door, and I'm a multitasker. I, I, I'm good to, you know, get in trouble, you know, drinking a cup of coffee while you're driving uh, on the cell phone and GPS, taking notes from the, and, and steering with my knee. I'm one of those terrible guys that you tell the police about that pull him over and arrest him. He's dangerous. So guilty as charged. It's one of my greatest sin problems. I'm not repenting yet either. So I uh, pray. <laughs> my wife is linear. She, now, when we, I, I learned as I studied my wife, some people are multitaskers and they just think that way. And I really struggle to, to be single-minded about her when she's talking to me because she's linear. She's single-minded. She's in sequence. She can wash the dishes way better than I can. But if I come in the kitchen and she's washing the dishes, and I say, hey, babe, she'll turn off the water, turn around and say, what? No, no, you can keep it. No. Oh. I'll, I'll, I'll watch it. This is more than talking to you. That's like single-mindedness. I said, can't we? No, I want to pay attention. I expect you to pay attention to me. I'm going to pay attention. I don't need that much attention. I'm in trouble. 
so, so I get to know my wife, and I understand, but I want to honor her, and I want her to feel honored, so I know, I know the ground rules. I've learned who she is, and some people think black and white. Some people are type A. Uh, I, I grew up thinking I was a type D, E, or F because of my, my parents degrading me so much, and so I didn't think I qualified for a letter, uh, but uh, after I, I, I got into the ministry and I realized I, c- I can lead, uh, I'm a, I, people now su- suggest I'm a soft A. I didn't marry a soft A. I thought I was at least a B, but now I'm, told I'm like a soft A because I'm so, I, I intentionally try to be, I have other sins, but gentle, kind, tender-hearted is kind of like what God blessed me with, so that's, the mercy thing is big for me. Some of the others are not, so I'm not better than you, just different, but knowing, knowing that about myself, my giftedness, and my shortcomings, um, as I do that, I found out I married a strong type A, and she's way more intelligent than I am. She really, I'm not bragging about her. She's book smart, academics. She, she's one of those Dean's List, A, Stereo A kind of disgusting students, you know, and I, I was, because I was goofing around, I, I was the one that was, you know, t- playing ball and chasing girls and getting in trouble, and so um, opposite ends of the spectrum in personality, so now I, if I want to care for her well, I have to know who she is. I have to be intimate with her and know how she thinks, and uh, is it black and white, or past, some people are pastel covers, colors, softy, and some people are that effervescent you know, neon colors, what kind of personality do you have? Do you know what kind of personality your wife has? Because if you're going to love her for who she is, you don't love her for who you thought she was. You learn to love her for who she is when you learn about who she is. And she would never tell you all who she is because she didn't trust you at the beginning. She told you a lot, but I guarantee you, uh, most of us can admit that, wow, I learned some things after the honeymoon that I didn't know was going to be part of the package. And so it is. So us husbands have to spend time, it says, Dwell with your wife in an understanding way. Get to know her. She's going to get to know us because wives are that way. They're so much more relational than the average guy. It's a problem here. So we guys got to do that. Now, I got to save time for the the gals, of course. Um, Gals, uh, guys, shut up. Close your ears. Pretend you're not listening. Be be dumb. Okay, so I didn't hear that at church. Remember, this is the time you say I wasn't paying attention. Um, Wives, how are you good at really respecting your guy in the personal life you may respect him in the church you may respect him in the community and you know we put on that church face when we come to church i try not to that's why i'm not too polished you know i just transparent and vulnerable get, some people don't like that they say you should be a little more proper you know, i didn't wear a tie i haven't worn a tie since one of my kids got married many years ago so uh, I, I'm not a Thai guy, and pastor didn't require it of me, so that's good. And so I'm just being regular. Uh, so as I'm regular, uh, we can put on our church face and respect each other wonderfully here, but then by the time you get in the car ride home, it's so different. And, so, and you can be a church leader, and you can be, and it's so different. And I, my heart goes out to you when you can't have a relationship with your husband who's fallen and broken, and you, and you can't respect him anymore. But he's not respectable. And I understand that. Some guys mess up. Guilty. I've been there. And I'm trying to be worthy of respect. But God didn't tell women to reverence their husbands if they were worthy. It's kind of one of those all things and those everything things. God has made it graphically clear that wives should respect their husbands regardless. Now, husbands can be abusive emotionally physically sexually they can be abusive i'm not saying allow yourself to be degraded but to treat yourself with respect and to distance yourself to you know i'm i'm 100 percent against divorce because god hates it and i'm sure there's divorce around there always is god's i don't never met a divorced person that said i'm so glad i'm divorced i've heard people say i'm so glad i'm not married to the jerk but i've never heard anybody say i'm so glad i, I always want to grow up and be a divorced person it just doesn't exist not in my experience so it's so sad. Now, I don't say you should put yourself in harm's way, and we talked about, you know, respect, but the Bible's graphically clear. Same thing uh, with uh, government. We need to respect the authority God puts over us. Same thing with employment. You need to respect your boss. Same thing with your husband. Men should receive respect, treatment from their wives, regardless. That's what the Bible says. And so um, the men aren't listening to this, so you, you're safe. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you and your God to say, how do I learn how to respect my husband for those of you that are really struggling? And there's a way to give honor, reverence, respect, and obey in all things. I'm not saying be enslaved. Don't, don't, don't 
take me to the other spectrum. There's a balance there. I've just told your husband to treasure you. If your husband was treasuring you well, this would be a non-issue. Wives would have no problem. They get married wanting to admire. The reason why I married Kathy so quickly, because we didn't get to know each other, is she admired me uniquely to any other woman I had ever met. Her admiration for me put me up there with hot air balloons. I couldn't touch ground. And it was unique to I had other girlfriends, long-term relationships. Nobody admired me the way Kathy did. And so I, I never had a problem at the, at the beginning with respect until I became the jerk. And once I became the jerk, then it was really hard for her to respect me. But regardless, I still want to do it for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, we need to reverence our husbands and obey him in all things um, that are not sinful. It's kind of like God's limited. You know, you're omnipotent, God's limited. He can't sin. But we, as as his children, miss the mark on this. When it comes to uh, disrespecting, uh, B is compliment uh, the husband. You should make up for his shortcomings. And now, uh, something about this respect and obedience thing towards husbands. Um, Your husband can be the jerk, and I've been there, so... Uh, he, you can be married to the jerk at the moment, and he may not believe it, but you know it's true. So you're really married to the jerk. The worst thing you can do is do something God never told a wife to do, is start to instruct a husband. When a wife instructs her husband, she degrades him to a child, and no man wants to uh, treasure his mommy in, in the right relationship. So when you start teaching down to him and instructing him like a teacher's does and you can ask him do I talk down to you now if he if he's not comatose he might be able to say yeah you talk down to me and so when you talk down to me it's belittling I I, I, you crush my ego it's what the world would say and so if you and my I've I loved and so my wife and I are talking about how how do you not treat me like a child so I don't feel emasculated because when I'm emasculated, I can't love my wife. I can get selfish and want selfish gratification, but when my wife's just emasculated, I may want sex to relieve the frustration and feel reconnected to my wife for the moment, but I'm not loving her. I'm medicating pain with sex, and so I don't want to do that, but I don't want my wife to talk down to me. So the way that worked, I I borrowed brains. I promise you nothing's new here for me. I borrowed from somebody. Um, My counselor started talking. If your wife wants to criticize you or instruct you or correct you and I need correcting I promise you I have now my wife comes to me when it's on a good day you know sometimes she walks in the room at the desk and she says we need to talk I said well that, that's not the that's not it so she can she can do that sometimes but on the more serious things she say um can, can we have a talk she asks she's in a humble way she'll come in can we talk now there's only one right answer uh, but sometimes I'm stupid remember not right now babe I'm busy you know, that, that, there goes that five pounds right out. I have learned. I, I like, almost never do that. Uh, if I'm off the phone, if I'm on the phone, you need to get off the phone. Can, can we please, please talk right now? So, Got to go. Talk to you later. Boom. I didn't like that client anyway. No, only kidding. Um, <laughs> so um, she'll come up to me in a humble way and says, can we talk? And I, I, if I say no, that's just stupid again. Uh, but during the transition, I would say no. She says, okay, fine. Can I, I'm doing something. So can I make a suggestion here? Same kind of attitude. Can I make a suggestion? No, I'm really frustrated. Just leave me alone. I said, okay. So she'll go in the next room. Now, I heard her, and sooner or later, the Holy Spirit says, wake up, Bobo. So, uh, okay. So I walk in the next room, and I say, sweetheart, uh, what were you going to say? And then she says, never mind, never mind. <laughs> I said, no sarcasm, babe. You had something on your mind. So most times, if not every time, she'll come over and say, I was going to say, why don't you try it this way? Now, just because she gives me a suggestion, and she might be right, doesn't obligate me to do what she told me. But I do want to honor her, treasure her with her advice, and say, thank you for your input. And I, do, I, I say thank you tons. So thank you for your input. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it her way. I still rather do it my way, mess up, and then do it a second time her way and get it right. Bozo the clown, you know, what, what can I tell you? So, so that's, that's how a wife can, if, and if you honor your husband that way and respect him, he will, it may, again, you're planting seeds. It may take a season till the harvest, but if you admire him and respect him and appreciate him, ladies, you do not, have, if you instruct him, you can't win because you're being the head of the house. You're talking down to a subordinate. You cannot, is that five minutes? 
Oh, I'm in trouble. Um, so you cannot talk down to him and get what you want from him as the, uh, a maturing, uh, strong head. So that's, uh, that's the, that. I want to go. I got five minutes to go to help for the hurting sheep. I hope you got the other sheep, help for the hurting. This is when you come to reconcile. Sometimes on the healing journey, people do not know what they need. So my, my husband hurt me. Uh, are there every, anybody need a copy of that? It's not in the booklet. Do we have extra copies in the back? If you could raise your hand. I think there's a bunch of copies in the back. They need that from up here. Um, this is healing for the hurting heart. It's, a, it's what I want. If you crushed me, this is what I want from you. This is healing for the hurting heart. Uh, they're coming through, and they'll, they'll, it's a big deal. The scripture says, therefore, if you... Uh, are offering your gift at the altar. You come and you're going to put your sacrificial lamb, your tithing down, and there you remember that your brother, your wife or husband, has something against you. Leave your gift in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your husband or wife, then come and worship God. Number one, what do I need from somebody when I'm being hurting? Is uh, I want someone to have compassion. I want them to be kind, gentle, terror, and sincere. If you offend me, uh, how do, what do I want from them? How do I know I can reconcile? I want you to come and say in your sweetest, kindest voice, hey, listen, you know, this is what the problem is. So number one is be kind, gentle, tender, hard, and sincere. Number two is consideration. That's huge. Consideration. Consider the experience of the other person. That means you got to get out of yourself, and we tend to be selfish. It's the natural thing. we got to get beyond ourselves. So what's it like for my wife or my kids? I offended my kids, and I don't want them to rebel. What's it like when I offend my kids or my parents? What, what am I looking for? How do I fix what's broke here? you got to start thinking things empathically through the eyes of the other person. So I ask my kids, so what was it like? I ask my wife, so what was it like? And I don't correct them. I don't say, no, it wasn't like that. It was like this. No, no. Tell me what it's like. Consider the experience of the other person. There's a progression in the second sentence there. Listen full of care. Listen carefully. Full of care. Look at the progression here. Listen full of care. Hear the person and completely understand the person and the problems cause his or her pain. I need to understand you. If I'm going to say, I really am sorry for crushing your toe, I need to know your toe's crushed. I don't want to uh, apologize for opening the window when your toe's hurting. Uh, I got to be on task, so I have to reflect back, empathic, reflective listening. Let me tell you, you know, uh, I'm listening full of care, hearing you and understanding the person, the problems, the cause of her pain. Truth be told, many, 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 many times, if we're in the office and I have the husband and wife, and the wife tells me a story, and so I ask the husband, what you hear? He's like on another planet. He's out in Pluto, that almost planet. Um, he, he, he's in a different place. And no, that's not what your wife said. So, I, sweetheart, repeat for your husband again. What, what, tell him again. Now, you listen now. And so then he, he gets it, and he changes the vocabulary. It's like, uh, I was angry. And she said, she said something about being mad. No, she didn't say mad. She said angry. I don't know what the difference is, but there's a difference to her because she didn't say she, uh, mad. She said angry. So we've got to build a bridge. And sometimes guys are just so walled off to their wives, sincerely. They can't hear, no matter how many times we go through it again, uh, would you mind if I represent you? Yes. So I say it in my male voice, my voice box, not her voice back. Oh, is that what she's saying? And tears are running down her cheeks. See, he never listens to me. He's never willing to hear me. So we think they're listening until they repeat back, reflect back. Don't, don't believe they got it until they prove they got it. Listen here and understand. Number three, confession. Acknowledge that the person is in pain. This is what I call, I'm sorry I hurt you. Admit and accept responsibility for your offenses. Uh, that's the end of the sentence, right? Admit and accept responsibility for your offenses without explanation or excuse. My, when I say, oh, I'm so sorry I stepped on your toe, let me tell you why. And you're like, whoa, Steve, stop it. I can tell you why you stopped. On, I don't have to hear it from you, but I want to tell you why I stepped on your foot. I don't have to hear it. I can tell you why. Whenever you say, I'm sorry, but, or let me tell you why I did what I did, the apology is gone. It has no weight. And so trust me on this. Try it a couple of times without explanation. See how it goes for you. I'm sorry I stepped on your toe. Thank you. But let me tell you what. No, no, no. No explanation, no excuses. Number four, cultivation. Pursue and nurture a godly relationship by meeting legitimate needs. I need a new Porsche, don't I? That's not a legitimate need. Sorry, that's not it. I, I don't need a new Porsche. Don't even want a Porsche. But the, the idea is, what's a legitimate need? Do you, do you, hey, do you need a day off? Why don't you go visit your mom for a day or go, go hang out with your sisters and uh, go, go, I'll take care of business. You know, maybe you need a break. What do you need? I meet a legitimate needs. So uh, number five is huge. Uh-oh. 
Uh, I promise I'll get done fast. Um, cancellation. Learn how to express genuine sorrow. Not fake sorrow. You can be sincere. Commit to learn and practice new behaviors. I'm going to repent. That's repentance. Growth in Christ. I'm going to learn and practice new behaviors. Ask for forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? Some people say, you know, it's like the old founder, I was ra 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 ra. I was ra 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 ra. I was ra ra wrong. Okay, got it out. I was wrong. Get good at that because you're wrong plenty. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, got it out. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? How many times do you have you asked your spouse to forgive you? Doesn't happen often in many, many, many homes. You're the exception probably because you probably do that. I was wrong. I hurt you. Will you please forgive me? Uh, godly sorrow works for pants. I'm going to do it differently. It's a big deal. Uh, sometimes people are so hurting. It's true. One of the times I was really the total jerk and my wife's hurting. I'm so sorry. You're absolutely right. Will you please forgive me? And she said, no, I, I, I'm not going to forgive you. What do you mean? You're not gonna, I can't right now. Why can't you right now? I'm hurting too bad. I can't even think about forgiveness yet. So I've learned that. Okay. Now my prayer is, because I'm the jerk, I'm stopping. Will you, will you please, will you please forgive me someday? And maybe, 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 but she has to. Otherwise, it turns to resentment and bitterness, and that's a big problem. So if they need time to forgive, we all know if they don't forgive, they commit the sin of unforgiveness. God tells us to forgive us as we've forgiven others, all kinds of things. Lastly, consolation, number six. Ask permission to express love and affection, both verbally and physically. It's not, can we have sex now? It's like, would a hug help you? It's giving the gift of affection for the good of another, not for selfish gain. You know, if I have sex and everything's okay, right? No. So would a hug help you? That's so much better. Father God, as we race through this, I just pray your blessing. Um, I pray these people would uh, be open and receiving to improving their most intimate relationships as they strive to be good and faithful husbands, being spiritual leaders. And the wives would learn how to not humiliate and embarrass or, or shame their husbands, but to learn how to reverence them appropriately. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.